Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verses 153 and 154, which read as follows. Aneka jati sang sarang, santo dukha jati punapunang. Kahakaraka dithosi puna gehang nakahasi Sambate pasuka bhaga gahakutang visankatang Visankaragatang jitang tanhanang kayam, kayam majaka Which means In the samsara, wandering on through many lives, aneka jati. Sandhavi sang, running around, wandering around. Anibi sang, finding nothing. Seeking out the house builder, the gahakar. Seeking out the builder of this house. Suffering. Suffering in birth again and again, or having suffering born again and again, suffering arising again and again, so much suffering seeking out the house builder. Gahakaraka Ditosi, I see you, house builder. You are seen, no, you are seen, house builder. Puna gehang nakahasi. You will not build a house again, a home again. All of your roof beams are shattered. Your peak destroyed. Your peak has been demolished. The mind that has gone to Visankara has been deconstructed, let's say. So your peak has been deconstructed, taken apart. Because then he used the same word, Visankara Gatang Chitang, the mind that has been taken apart, deconstructed, obtains the destruction of craving. Tanha nang kaya manjaka. It says um, an important pair of verses. Hopefully, it sounds as wonderfully profound as it actually is. These are two verses said to have been spoken by the Buddha right after he became really the first thing he said as a Buddha. Aneka jati sangsarang. The story of the Buddha is quite interesting. We can recap it briefly in a few minutes, a few seconds. Many lifetimes ago, Aneka jati, the, Bod the Bodhisatta, this, this ascetic, Sumedha, heard about a Buddha. And he went to see the Buddha, but uh, he looked at the Buddha and he thought to himself, if I were to learn from this, this Buddha, I could become enlightened. But he thought to himself, I'm so powerful, so well advanced in my spirituality. What if I were to try to become a Buddha myself? And so he made a vow then and there that was affirmed by the, that Buddha, Dipankara, to become a Buddha himself. And he spent countless lifetimes seeking out, seeking out the house builder. Until finally he found it under the Bodhi tree. He was born Siddhartha in the Gautama clan. And at 29 years, old, years of age, he left home went into the forest, 
tried many ways of becoming enlightened for six years and failed until finally he realized that he should give up extreme practices. He shouldn't strive to break, his, break himself. He should strive to understand himself. So he found a middle way. And lo and behold, he, he was broken. It, the, the rafters, the, the, the house broke itself. He didn't have to destroy it through force, it, through force, just through the understanding and knowledge and wisdom. Broke down the walls and the roof. So it's this is a verse common to all Buddhas. It describes the attainment of Buddhahood. But more than that, it, it, it describes some very important quality of, of Buddhist meditation practice or Buddhist theory, philosophy. And that is the constructing and deconstructing of the self, really, of identity. What the Buddha is talking here is about the, the self. This idea of self, identity that we have. I've been thinking um, and talking and mulling over, debating this concept of identity, hearing, hearing a lot about identity, protecting people's identity and um, affirming one's own identity, clinging to one's own identity identifying with one's views, with one's opinions. It's perhaps a defilement or a problem that we don't pay enough attention to, we don't talk enough about in, in Buddhism, that we should perhaps talk more about. We're often much more concerned with greed and anger. They're very easy to... Greed and anger are much easier to identify. Identify, much easier to recognize much more difficult to catch the subtle identification and, and attachment to self and personality. It's not something that's easy to be mindful of, it's something that requires clarity to overcome. It requires a sharp mind seeing moment by moment just like a person would uh, take apart a roof piece by piece one has to take apart one's reality moment by moment piece by piece and understand not not the self but understand that which creates the self the house builder, Gahakara, Gahakaraka. And so ultimately identity is a very, very problematic thing. I mean, it's, it's in no way any good. It's not identification except in a functional sense where I say I'm a monk. As a functional, practical, Reality. It's it's not it's not in and of itself a problem, but that's not identification. That's that's um, convenience. Identification means when you take something and you say, "This is me. This is mine," where you have some some measure of clinging to it, where you place some importance on that. Like if I say, "Well, this is." my body and this is my robe if I don't place any importance on that and I'm just clear that okay this is the robe I can wear because it's not his robe I can't wear that robe because it's his otherwise it causes all sorts of confusion and perhaps problems if I look at my hand and I see there's a cut or something I have to recognize oh that's my body I have to clean that cut I have to care for it But if I don't ascribe importance to it, it's, it only becomes a problem when we 
when we attach to it, when there's some importance, when it takes on some importance beyond the obvious. Where we see something and we have some expectation or some, some clinging to it. That gives rise then, of course, to liking it and disliking it and being pleased and displeased, preferring this, preferring that. Identification is sort of the root of all of the other problems that arise, and defilements of greed and anger. Because we wouldn't, we, we don't cling to things except to think of them as ours or to wish for them to be ours. When someone else gets hurt, it only upsets us insofar as we can relate, insofar as we can think of ourselves being hurt. Identity is a cause for such great suffering. It's the, that which keeps us bound to samsara. We cling to ideas of who we are, what we are. We cling to ideas of how good we are, how, of our worth, how worth we are, how worthless we are. We conceive of ourselves in many different ways, as men, as women, or neither men nor women, but something else. Either way, it's all identity. We identify ourselves politically, we identify ourselves socially, we identify ourselves by our age, by our skin color, by our ethnicity, by our religion by our views and beliefs, we identify ourselves by these, we cling to them. And they're very difficult to let go, it's very difficult to adapt. If someone calls in to question your identity, which is what we see a lot now, when someone, your identity is threatened, we become quite upset. No question. No question that this is a, a problem. There's no question that this is something to be understood and to free oneself from rather than to cling to and, and, and to pride oneself on. Right? Be proud that I'm a monk. Proud that I was born Jewish. Proud that I'm white. Or sort of white, pink maybe. Proud that I'm a man. Proud that I'm so smart. Proud that I'm a teacher, right? So many things to be proud of. There's this whole gay pride movement, right? And that's the bad side of it really, is that it, it does cr create sort of a pride or it's what it's meant to counter is the the insecurity and the sometimes self hatred and loathing. And so, it's important to be careful of these things. I mean, in the, it's an interesting sort of extreme example of gay pride, I think. Um, because there's an issue being addressed whereby they're meant to feel worthless, perverted, evil. They're meant to, f they're made to feel guilty. The people who are deviant, and, and that's, they really are deviant in the sense that most people, the majority of people don't, don't uh, have that attraction to the same gender or, or whatever. Although funny, you know, we all have crazy, everyone has their own crazies. But, uh, made to, to feel bad about it. And so this pride is addressing that. 
it's important to acknowledge that. It's important, and this is why I think it's important to acknowledge people's identity. It's important to allow people the freedom to breathe as they are and to not feel bad about who they are or feel uh, somehow left out. You know, it's important to make people feel proud of themselves in a sense. Just as a, as a means of, of creating the mental stability required to deconstruct the self. Right? If you're constantly being told that you're worthless, that you're perverse, that you're bad and evil, you can't possibly ever... Uh, it's much more difficult to have a whole uh, healthy state by which you can come to understand yourself. You know, who am I? If you have these desires and you know, the desires that we all have if you're told that they're wrong which we often are sexual desire is naughty is dirty and if you constantly feel that and you feel the guilt how could you ever possibly be objective about it and understand it so that's what that's addressing I think I think it's important but it's it's, it's even more important and, and, and on a deeper level important that we be clear that our ultimate aim should be a free, to free ourselves from any sort of identity because it's never good or useful. It doesn't have any ultimate purpose besides to create pride, conceit, vanity, none of which are useful or beneficial to us or others, all of which are harmful, all of which are the true problem, right? If you don't have any Attachment, you know, if you're not attached to your body, then when someone calls you fat or thin or white or black, it doesn't really bother you. you know? Even Sariputta said, if, um, I think Sariputta, but then if someone were to beat you, if someone were to hit you, What are they hitting? They're just hitting a body. It's just a, they're, they're giving rise to certain experiences. If you don't attach to the body, it's not possible to. It's not possible to be uh, to be to, to be tortured. And so the ultimate goal and the ultimate the ultimate solution is to free ourselves from any sort of identity. It really is this de deconstructing that the Buddha is talking about. It's the most profound aspect of the meditation when you're able to break down who you are, deconstruct who you are into constituent parts and see that we're made up of mainly a mishmash of habits and, and patterns of behavior that are very much out of our control. They have a power of their own and we've been feeding that power for far too long. And when we stop feeding it, when we get rid of this thirst, this craving, and when we get rid of ignorance, when we understand craving, when we understand the results of craving, we understand the stress and the suffering that comes from craving and clinging, and when we understand identity, understand the results of identifying with things, with the, the consequences of and the vulnerability of identity, then we let go of it, we drop it like a hot coal, we break down the house. So, a very interesting verse, and interesting in that it helps us remember this idea of identity, helps us think about 
and apply this in our meditation practice to see how we identify with things and to remind us that none of this is ours or me or mine and any identification with anything is just a cause for confusion, stress, suffering when you think of the people in the world who are tortured because of their identity or their feeling they don't have an identity or that their identity is threatened or denied or that kind of thing, how much they suffer and we should be able to empathize and sympathize and use it as an example for ourselves to realize this is something that we'd be better off without any sort of identification any sort of identity. So, there you go. That's my take on 153 and 154. Thank you all for tuning in. Wish you all the best. <laughs>